Karina, thanks a lot. Um, I'm Song Bei Li. I'm the Ag Finance Team Lead at USAID. I'm based in Washington, D.C. Um, I've been here about three years. And the topic of today's discussion is agricultural finance. In Africa, we'll be looking at two ways that capital be, can be channeled, not the only ways, but uh, funds in general and banks. And we'll be focusing on what we can learn by looking at transaction sizes. Uh, so this is not a, I wouldn't consider this an introduction to agricultural finance webinar. We hope to get uh, pretty technical. So if that's what you are looking for, welcome. And if it's not, I apologize in advance. So we're gonna start with introductions um, and then with our two panelists and then get into the discussion. And I'll also be answering, asking some of the questions that were asked on LinkedIn when we publicize this event, but we also hope to get some uh, to some of your questions that you put in the chat. And so I don't know if folks can see, but it looks like folks are still trickling in, but just to let you know, we're about, we're at about 80, 80 people um, in the webinar. So with that, um, start out with introduction. So Chris, so originally I wanted to ask you what Ag Dev Code does, but instead I wanna read a LinkedIn post uh, that you wrote about a year ago that I really loved because it really was one of the most transparent, direct and succinct descriptions of an investment fund out there. And, and I say that uh, not only because it stands out, but because of usually um, for whatever reason, uh, it's very hard to tell exactly what an investment fund does. So what, what, it, what it said, Ag Devco offers patient finance for growing African agribusinesses. Terms for mezzanine debt are six to 8% debt plus an equity kicker, which if we are successful in helping you deliver long-term profitability and social impact should give us a 12% plus return. Ticket sizes are typically 3 million to 10 million with the ability to invest through multiple rounds. We look for impactful companies with excellent management and a track record of growth with positive cash flows and existing revenues over 5 million. Now you see some of this on websites for other agricultural funds, but never in the detail, the cost, their returns. So just uh, saying, I think that's great. Uh, maybe there's a couple terms in there that already are getting a little bit more technical beyond just equity and debt. You talk about mezzanine, you're talking about multiple rounds. I'm confused. Are we talking about debt or equity? Um, I don't know if you could at least uh, expand a little bit on that. Sure, and good afternoon, everyone, from a, a very wet and windy London. Um, so I'm Chris Isaac. I'm the Chief Investment Officer at AgDevCo. Happy to answer your technical question, Songbei, but first, I'd just like to say a couple of things about why AgDevCo is here, and I imagine why many of you are dialed into the call today, and that's the importance of more investment into African agriculture. And just a few headline facts that are familiar to, to many of you. The World Bank says that by 2030, 90% of extreme poverty will be in Africa. So this poverty is increasingly an, an Africa issue. Um, we also know that 80% of the poor in Africa live in rural areas. And thirdly, we know from research by the World Bank, but also IFAD and others, uh, investing in agriculture is at least two to three times more effective at reducing poverty than investment in any other sector. So the more we can do in agriculture, the better chance we have of tackling poverty in, in rural Africa. And there's a need for investment across the board for at all sizes and at all levels. And AgDevCo is a small player and we can do our part, but we're by no means a silver bullet. Um, but to your questions, Songbei, mezzanine. Well, we found that this is a product that works well um, for uh, medium-sized African agriculture businesses. Um, mezzanine is a hybrid between debt and equity. It's a long-term instrument, so typically with a tenor of, of at least 10 years. Uh, it's flexible because it doesn't require significant repayments in the early years, so it gives time for a company to get established. If you're growing a tree crop for those trees to come to maturity, or if you're building a factory for you to get up to a certain um, level of efficiency. Uh, 
and it's non-dilutive, which means that um, uh, it's not diluting the owners of the, the business significantly. But it also shares risk with the shareholders, um, typically through a warrant, which means that if the company does well, then we as the mezzanine provider would share in the long-term profitability and get to that sort of 12 to 15% return that I referred to in the, in the LinkedIn post. So it's long-term, it's flexible, um, and it means that you don't have to have a, a long and difficult conversation about valuation, which is, is uh, never easy for relatively early stage agribusinesses. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, oh, go ahead. Well, you asked about multiple rounds as well. Um, so, yes, these days we will typically be investing at a ticket size of three to five million, sometimes more than that. Um, and then we are prepared to do subsequent rounds. So we might get up to a total exposure in one business of 10 to 20 million where we're seeing success, where we're seeing impact at scale. Often this will be where we're helping a company move into new new countries um, in sub-Saharan Africa. Great. So on that, so the reason I was confused about multiple rounds, I usually think of equity, but you're talking it could be multiple rounds of mezzanine. And because your mezzanine is so has such a long tenor, you'll be adding to your existing exposure versus most lenders, they lend, repay, lend, repay. Yes, um, and indeed, we can offer other instruments as well. So we might go in with a mezzanine instrument, but then once we've built a relationship, uh, uh, we have confidence in the company, they have confidence in us. Perhaps at that point, we would take um, some equity in the group company. Got it. And and you mentioned you target medium. You said mezzanine is a um, you felt well suited for medium sized companies. Mm. Well, what would you define medium? And, and maybe use transaction size. What, what, is this these transaction sizes call it three million to twenty million? The range you mentioned would that fit in the definition of medium for AgDevCo? Yes. Um, so you could think about it in ticket size. Like how much do we invest in a, in a single round? And that's typically three to ten million. Uh, or you could think about it in revenues. In my post, I think I referred to five million dollars of revenue. Um, so. Uh, in African agriculture, these are medium, or some may consider them fairly large companies, but they're still very much SMEs on any global definition. And many are still very early stage companies. They might be of a reasonable size, but they may not yet be profitable uh, and only have very limited access to commercial capital. So often our investees do have some existing relationships with banks and can access some level of working capital but they find it very difficult to access long-term investment to build a factory or to plant out a, 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 an orchard of avocado trees. Okay, then that leads me to my last question before I turn it over to Brian. <coughs> Excuse me. What is the difference between Ag Devco and a bank? And I, and I think I incorrectly called you a fund. So, we're, indeed, we're not a fund. We are a, um, a, a holding company structure. Um, you could think of us as Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. The only difference being we're, we're about 1% of the size and far less profitable. Um, but the important point being, as a holding company, we can invest for the long term. A fund has to be in and out within a certain period of time, often five or six years. And in our view, that doesn't really fit um, what the need in, in agriculture. Um, the key difference between us and a bank is that we provide longer term, more equity like capital. Um, uh, and we also play a very hands on role, sitting on company boards, engaging frequently with senior management in those companies, thinking about strategy thinking about um, resourcing needs, be they human or capital, uh, and together trying to grow the profitability and impact of those businesses. Um, and when you talk about um, even, so first of all, even though you're not technically a fund, a holding company, I kind of, in general terms, I, I just consider you an open-ended fund structure using fund in quotes, but um, banks, like this, this distinction between longer term funding that you can provide and, and shorter term funding that banks provide, I hear, when we say short term, just to put 
like some more detail on that. Are we talking about less than a year typically from banks? Uh, a lot of bank lending will be that tenor, but uh, you, you will see banks lending sort of three to five years in African countries. Rarely do they go beyond that. There are exceptions, uh, and it tends to be heavily weighted towards working capital, yep. i.e. Um, financing, you know, movements of, of goods. Um, what you need when you're growing a business, especially if you're at a stage where you don't yet have a strong balance sheet, is equity type financing because you can't offer collateral to banks. And uh, I mean, Brian is, is the expert here, but often banks will be looking for collateral cover ratios that are very high. I mean, it's not rare to see a requirement for two times cover in terms of the security you have to offer a bank. Uh, and, and many early stage companies aren't unable to offer that. And and what kind of coverage does AgDevCo require or ask for on its MES? Well, it depends on the instrument. So um, clearly equity doesn't require collateral. Uh, mezzanine can, can range from fully unsecured, in which case there needs to be a bigger equity kicker to a secured mezzanine product where um, you would expect security cover at least of at least one times the loan value. Okay, thank you. And um, this is great because I am familiar with AgDevCo, but learning learning more. And Brian, I'm going to switch it over to you. Your Aceli is not a bank, is not a fund, is not a holding company, uh, but you work you work with different types of lenders in Africa. Can you? I would say maybe you, you might disagree with that you're a complicated activity to describe. Um, can you can you give us an introduction to? Oh, sorry, to yourself and and Aceli and Chris. Sorry for jumping right into it without asking you to introduce yourself. Thanks, Songbei. Um, Brian Milder, the founder and CEO of Aceli Africa. So Aceli, we consider ourselves an incentive facility. We don't lend directly. We don't provide capital to other lenders but we provide incentives to shift the risk return profile so that a marketplace of lenders can more profitably do agricultural SME lending. Uh, the loans that we support are at a smaller ticket size than where AgDevCo works. So we're focused on loans ranging from 15,000 US dollars up to 1.75 million. The average loan is about $100,000. I'll talk more about some of the different segments that that we support later. Um, the model stems from a recognition that in middle and higher income countries, the government typically provides risk sharing and other enabling policies to allow private capital to flow to agriculture and to other risky segments of the market that provide a development impact or otherwise are, are contributing to social good. And in the African context, those enabling pilot policies either are nascent or non-existent. And so using donor funds, we're trying to demonstrate an approach that could be over time integrated into the policy environment um, in various countries. And the way that we do that is we offer two different types of incentives. Um, one is a risk sharing approach, and it's uh, different than a typical guarantee structure. Most guarantees are 50% risk sharing on a loan by loan basis. Um, we feel that that approach can be valuable, but in and of itself is not sufficient in agri, um, where lenders are reluctant to take a lot of exposure and to, to tell lenders, well, you should do more lending into a, a, a sector that's already riskier than other sectors that you might serve, and we'll cover half of your, your losses. Um, isn't adequate. And so our approach is a portfolio level first loss where every loan that the lender makes, we deposit a percentage of the loan value into a reserve account. So a lender originates a loan, let's say it's $100,000, we would deposit 5% or $5,000 of, of funds from donors into a reserve account for that lender. Um, lender makes one loan, it takes 95% of the risk. Our first loss is not really doing all that much. But as the lender makes more and more loans, it builds up a larger reserve that becomes a buffer against any losses in its portfolio. Um, so that's, that's one approach. 
The incentives themselves are tiered. So we offer a higher percentage for loans to first time borrowers. And also we have different impact bonus areas related to gender and youth inclusion, food security, and nutrition, and climate and environment. And so we want to motivate lenders to seek out and serve the highest impact borrowers. Um, we then have a second type of incentive that addresses the operating cost, transaction cost in agri. And so if you think about a multi-million dollar loan, if that loan repays, it should be profitable. It should cover the operating costs of the lender. When you downscale that loan to say 50 or $100,000, the lender is still incurring a lot of cost, especially if it's a business that's uh, in a, a producer, it's maybe far from a, a bank branch. There's a lot of um, travel costs involved to originate and monitor the loan. Um, and the, the interest in fee revenue on that loan um, might not cover the cost, even when the loan repays. And so we offer lenders an origination incentive for smaller loans, in this case, uh, from 15,000 up to 500,000. Um, and in general, across all the loans that we support, we provide about a 10% in, uh, incentive. So a $100,000 loan might qualify for $10,000 split between that first loss reserve at a portfolio level and then the transaction support. Um, so we're working um, in East Africa, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, and expanding to Zambia with a marketplace of lenders. Um, we work with many commercial banks. We also work with non-bank financial institutions, with international social impact lenders. Um, we want to see a, a marketplace of lenders with different financial products. Uh, but certainly it's the case that banks have been the highest volume participants, and we see a lot of opportunity to unlock their balance sheets and um, their distribution channels through their branch network to reach many more um, agricultural SMEs. That's great. I think I was just checking off the follow-up questions I was going to ask you as you answered them, but that's great. And I, I'm also glad, that, you know, I think there's a lot there, um, but I'm glad you're using, you gave that example just so people get an idea, that 10% example of the total incentives. I, I know we had back and forth on that for a while. Um, <coughs> can you tell me, I'm just, I'm sure, sure, out of the two incentives, which one do you think is, uh, you know, had more interest from your bank partners? Yeah, hands down, lenders love the origination incentive, which shouldn't be a surprise. We make it as an unrestricted payment. So a lender registers a loan with us. It meets our qualifying criteria. Once that loan has been outstanding for 90 days, then the lender is eligible to receive the incentive payments. And so on a quarterly basis, we're sending out um, payments and batches to lenders and their origination incentives are unrestricted. So lenders decide how they want to use the funds. Typically, they use them to cover travel costs, especially fuel to, to do due diligence visits, to hire and train more specialists in agriculture, but also to do value chain analyses and adapt their product offering. And I saw a question in the chat, are lenders changing their financial products? And we've seen some really interesting examples of lenders going from a very standard um, asset-backed financial product monthly amortizing schedule, um, appropriate maybe for an urban manufacturing business, not appropriate for an agricultural business with a cyclical cash flow, and now moving to warehouse inventory receipts product with different pricing, um, totally different collateral. Um, and so that's the direction that, that we see lenders moving and the incentives are an important nudge in that. Thanks, Brian. And on that point, I am not looking at the chat right now because I'm paying attention to your responses, but both of you, uh, when the other are speaking, if you see, look at the chat and see there's questions that um, you could quickly address, feel free to jump in, jump in on those. I, I want to highlight the point you made though, Brian, about which incentive is more popular. One, <coughs> I wouldn't call it criticism, but a comment I hear more and more often and I agree with about blended finance is it overly focuses on de-risking. So yes, we, de we do need to de-risk investments, but the thing I would emphasize is your point, even if a loan repays in, in, in what we're saying, there's zero risk 
the loan, the bank might not make the loan because it's not profitable because the costs are too high most of the time when we're talking about small transaction sizes. So thanks. Uh, the last question, Brian, on the introduction on this introduction um, part, how did you design your incentives? Sure. Yeah. So um, I worked previously for an international impact investor, Root Capital, and um, Root and several of the other international social lenders, including AgDevCo, um, formed an industry alliance called CSAF, the Council on Smallholder Agricultural Finance. And so in conversations among the CSAF members going back to around 2017, we, we were identifying the challenges that we all faced around risk and transaction costs and started developing this idea for a CELI. And along the way, as we were pitching USAID and other funders, we, we kept hearing, well, you have a certain credibility as practitioners, but can you put data behind your assertions that agri SME lending is riskier and and less profitable than other sectors. And so we spent a couple of years gathering that data um, and then going beyond the international social lenders, engaging local banks and non-banks in, uh, in East Africa in particular. And so we now have a data set of about $5 billion of transactions, uh, I think about 30,000 loans now. Uh, we'll be putting out a new uh, benchmarking report early in the new year. And um, it's that data that that informs. I will say the data is far from perfect. It's um, relatively straightforward to get a list of transactions that lenders have made, even the performance of those loans, but to start to assign operating costs um, when lenders all have different methodologies and, and data is, is very hard. So we're piecing it together as best we can, and then we use the data and then just a lot of engagement with the market to try to calibrate these incentives. And just the follow on, is that data available to any other activities that want to use it in the design of their own incentives? So we put out the, the report as a public good. The data itself is under confidentiality agreements with individual lenders. And those agreements are also subject to the data protection laws in each country. So unfortunately at this time, we can't make the raw data publicly available. Over time though, we would like to work with the regulators in, in each country and, and try to make that uh, more publicly available. Okay, thanks Brian. So I just wanna quickly summarize a couple points. So AgDevCo, is an investment fund or more accurately a holding company. But the point I'm making, I wanted to make is um, they raise capital and then they invest it in equity and mezzanine. Um, and so they want, they want to get their money back with the return. So they, and they want a social and financial return. A Sally, Brian said it, but I, just to make sure it comes through, does not lend or invest itself directly. And it only works with lenders. So a CELI is 100% grant funded. And I don't know if you describe it this way, but I can't think of a better word, Brian, you're giving grants to banks to make, to lend, to um, make uh, specific types of loans that we think will have uh, enough impact to make those payments uh, valuable. So a CELI receives no financial return. All of its return it's getting is a social return. <laughs> so what we heard, uh, is that the work that AgDevCo does, and Chris is talking about, focuses on larger transaction sizes. Aseli, through the banks it works with, focuses on smaller transaction sizes. And we believe that both of these activities are having a lot of impact, but clearly a different type of impact because of these transaction sizes. And that's what we're gonna um, dive into a little bit more next. <laughs> so, in a comment to my LinkedIn post, uh, Kiri Books, sorry if I mispronounced that, from the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation wrote, the big elephant in the room is often transaction size. So Chris, can you walk us through how transaction size can be thought of as a proxy for your strategy pre and post 2017? Sure, um, and I'll start by saying, uh, agriculture is a tough business anywhere in the world. Um, in fact, in many parts of the world, it's heavily subsidized. I grew up on a small farm in South Wales um, with sheep. 
And those hill farmers only survive because they receive subsidies every year. And uh, on your side of the Atlantic Song Bay, um, farmers can access crop insurance, which is heavily subsidized by the government. Um, in Africa, there's very little subsidy coming into agriculture. Um, so it's a tough business. It's particularly tough um, when you're talking about small transaction sizes, small investments, and, and, and Brian's touched on this already, but there are high costs to, to, to making an investment in terms of doing the due diligence, in terms of documenting the transaction, in terms of managing that investment, sometimes over many years, and then, and then finally exiting it. Um, so it's, it's hard to get the returns in agriculture that are sufficient to cover those costs, which is why, at least in our experience, when in the first few years of AgDevCo, we made small investments, typically below half a million dollars in size, we lost money. Um, we, that wasn't a surprise to us. We knew it was going to be difficult. Um, and if we look back at that portfolio, we expect to eventually recover around 70, 70 cents in each dollar invested. Um, so you can look at that from two angles. <laughs> with, with an investor hat on, it's a disastrous performance. Um, if you come at it in terms of um, a use of aid funds or grant, arguably it's an efficient way of deploying grant because you get back 70 cents and you can recycle it. Uh, I'm, I'm worth saying at this point that AgDevCo is a vehicle that is owned by a trust and is ultimately non-profit. So any returns we make, we will recycle into doing more of the same. Um, so why did we shift away from that strategy? Well, two, two reasons. Firstly, at that point, we were 100% funded by the UK government. And in around 2017, aid budgets in many parts of the world came under pressure. And uh, the UK aid program said, look, you can't rely on us continuing to provide grant every year to cover your operating costs. Um, but we were also reflecting on what was the best way of achieving impact with the resource we had available to us. And what we'd found is that the, the challenge of working with small companies is, is that they often stay small um, and there's a relatively high failure rate. So I'd say our successes in terms of businesses that went on to become profitable and to grow, to scale up and achieve more impact was around three out of 10. Um, now, venture capital in, in, in the developed parts of the world will have a similar sort of success rate. The difference is in venture capital, your successes often make a lot of money and you don't see that in agriculture. Some of the reasons I was referring to earlier. So pre 2017, we were doing very additional investing in very early stage, often startup companies, um, but we were losing money and we weren't seeing impact at scale. We then had to shift. We had to shift to try and ourselves get to the point where we could cover our operating costs and have the chance of making a return that we could reinvest. Um, uh, and we wanted to work with companies that were more able to operate at scale, to take a successful model for one country and to expand it to other countries. And that would reach not hundreds of farmers, but potentially tens or hundreds of thousands of smallholder farmers. Um, so from 2017, we started to rebalance the portfolio by targeting larger deals alongside our existing portfolio of small legacy deals. So we're not 100% uh, invested in large companies today. Of our 38 investments, 10 are still legacy investments from pre-2017. But by rebalancing the portfolio with some larger partners, we've been able to move to profitability for the first time this year. Uh, and this is our 14th year. Um, we're not making large profits. We will make sufficient profit to cover our running costs and return capital, return, make a return for our investors. So these days we have raised capital from uh, DFC, the, the um, Development Finance Corporation in the US, that has provided us with debt. Uh, and we also have um, preference share capital from two DFIs, 
North Fund and British Investment International. We have to provide a return to those three investors at low modest levels. Uh, and then any surplus we make uh, after that, we can reinvest. So we feel for, for us, we have the right balance now, a mixed portfolio of large and small deals, a strategy that targets that sort of middle tier of companies that are capable of delivering impact at scale and the ability to offer investors in AgDevCo a low single digit return. We're not going to attract any private investment into AgDevCo offering those low levels of return, but we think it's a compelling offer for DFIs and other impact minded investors who care equally, if not, not more so about impact relative to uh, the percentage return they get on their capital. Uh, so much to unpack there, but um, I do. I'm a, I just want to make sure we get to at least one question from the chat, and uh, and I think it was a good one from Dick Tinsley, who said basically, and I forgot to ask both of you to talk about this. What is the connection of your work with smallholder farmers? Is it is the, are they are they the end beneficiary? Are they secondary? How, how do you think of smallholder farmers? And Chris, I'll, I'll just let you continue and answer that first. Yeah, sure. So almost every one of our investments touches smallholder farmers, either as suppliers of raw materials or as um, customers, um, but not all of our investments. So um, first, let me give you one or two examples of, of, of companies that work with large numbers of smallholder farmers. Um, so uh, one of our most impactful businesses is a poultry business called Hatch Africa, which supplies day old chicks. Uh, these are dual purpose chickens that are good for laying eggs and they're very good for, for meat as well. And Hatch Africa now is present in six countries. Uh, it started in Ethiopia and Agdevco wasn't involved in the early days, but we've supported Hatch to, to expand into five further countries. And they now touch over 10 million households. These are all rural households who are getting access to uh, improved breeds of chickens that are fully inoculated, lay more eggs, and uh, can be sold in the market uh, for meat. So that's that's putting income into into uh, deep into the rural areas. They also work with a, a large um, network of agents. These are individual entrepreneurs who raise the chickens um, to six or seven weeks. And the company estimates that each agent now can earn profits of sixteen hundred dollars per year. So if you do the maths, 16,000 agents times $1,600 per year, that's a lot of money going to, let's call them micro entrepreneurs across those six countries. So that's the type of impact at scale that we're really excited to see. Um, more traditionally, we work with outgrowers in um, smallholder outgrowers in outgrower schemes. So one example being our macadamia business in Northern Malawi near Mizuzu. Um, that company buys macadamia nuts, but also chili and paprika from 4,000 farmers. Those chilies are sold into Nando's, a fast food restaurant um, uh, uh, that started in South Africa. So we're connecting farmers to market in, in that way. But we do also work with companies that don't engage directly with, with smallholder farmers. And why would we do that? Well, the reason is because we see potential to help build profitable industries where African countries have competitive advantage. Um, so one example being avocados, we have three or four investments in avocados uh, and there is only limited purchasing from smallholder farmers in those cases. These are commercial farms that sell avocados into Europe and increasingly into China and India. Um, What's the impact case there? Well, uh, if we can show that that African countries are as good as, if not better at producing these products than anywhere else in the world, then we demonstrate to other investors and to private investors that they should replicate th those types of investments. And that over 10, 20 years, if you can build a thriving agriculture export industry, that's the way of getting hard currency into these economies and helping countries move beyond reliance on aid. Thanks, Chris. Just to clarify, is Hatch a rebrand of Ethio Chicken or is that, or is that a different company? It, it is the same company. So Ethio Chicken is the brand in Ethiopia. Oh, okay. It's so, called Hatch Africa. Got it. Hatch Africa. Thank you. And, and Brian, so same question. 
Yeah, thanks, Songbei. And Karina, maybe um, we could tee up the slides now. So on average, um, I mentioned a $100,000 loan uh, that- I'm that... sorry, about the, I wanted to ask you about the connection that's selling to smallholder farmers. Are you gonna use the slides to answer that question too? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the average SME is receiving a loan of $100,000. Um, the business has revenues of $700,000. It employs 16 workers and purchases from about 600 smallholder farmers. So there's a wide range across the, the businesses that we support from um, agro dealers, input suppliers to cooperatives of smallholder farmers involved in primary production to businesses at a post harvest handling or processing stage of the value chain. And here we've, we've broken down the loans by size segment um, and specifically the percentage of loans that are going to first time borrowers. Before we launched, we thought maybe about 30 to 35% of the loans would go to first time borrowers. It's been over 60% uh, um, and we see it really weighted to the smaller loans. And so you can see here the smallest size segment loans of 15,000 up to 49. Um, about 90% of those loans are going to first time borrowers. Um, and then with the larger ticket sizes, and we go up to 1.75 million, um, businesses, not surprisingly, have better access to finance. Um, so, in the next click, um, you'll be able to see the leverage ratio. And here, the leverage ratio is uh, the relationship between capital mobilized in the numerator and the cost of the incentives that Aselli is providing. Overall, our leverage ratio is about 10x. And when I'm talking to Songbei and his colleagues at USAID, we, we reference in, in the US context, the, the government is providing a similar subsidy to Bank of America and JP Morgan um, for lending to, into low income urban communities, uh, community development finance in the US. So I just think, you know, when we talk about public enabling environment and, and subsidy in agriculture, it's not just in agriculture, it's in lots of different sectors that we see in, in many middle and high income countries. Um, the leverage ratio is inversely related to the capital additionality. So we have to spend relatively more um, in terms of our incentives for these smaller ticket sizes that are more likely to go to businesses that ha don't have access to finance. And then for the larger ticket sizes, you know, the, it's, it's much more commercial we're providing a smaller um, relative nudge for the lenders to serve those businesses. Um, so in the next click, um, you can see kind of the distribution of loans. Um, we're at about 1500 loans and they're really concentrated on the left side in these smaller ticket sizes. Um, loans under 250,000 comprise um, upwards of 85% of the total loans. And I think, you know, to the, the businesses that, that Agdevco are serving um, that, that have a lot of scale that really can, can reach, um, you know, Chris talked about some of the numbers with Hatch Africa, it's, it's critical to be supporting those businesses. Um, there just aren't very many of them. Uh, we need to create a pipeline for more businesses that, that could grow in that direction and there's also a large part of the uh, economy that's concentrated in these, these smaller businesses. So in the next click, you can see kind of what this looks like in terms of, of numbers. On average, these smaller businesses are serving far fewer farmers and workers. Um, there's about a, a 30 fold difference um, in the reach of the small businesses um, to the large ones. And, and here, this is mostly farmers that are supplying the SME. Um, and then on the next build, you can see though, that when you consider the number of, of loans, um, Karina, can you just go to the, the next slide? Thanks. Um, when you see, when you add up though, the number of smaller businesses, um, the collective number of farmers and workers for these smaller businesses is far greater than the large businesses alone. And again, I'm not trying to pit the large versus the small, but to point out that when you add up the, the activity um, at the smaller end of the spectrum, there are a lot of businesses reaching thousands, hundreds of thousands, and really 
millions of, of farmers and workers. And that's a large share of the agricultural economy um, that is currently underdeveloped and where interventions can really make a big difference. Um, so if you click further, Rena, you can see um, the average revenue is, um, there, there are differences between these smaller um, loan size segments and the larger loan size segment, but the variance in revenue is not nearly as large as the variance in loan size. And my interpretation of that is that the smaller businesses are particularly underserved and in some ways underperforming their potential. Um, they're getting loan amounts that are not adequate to their needs, um, but as they start to get working capital in particular, they will be able to, to grow quickly and move up the curve. And that's what we've been seeing. About 10% of the businesses that uh, we've supported with our incentives are coming back for a second loan. And we see that their average revenue growth from year one to year two is about 27%. Um, so very healthy growth in terms of their top line revenues. And about 60% of their revenues flow through to farmers um, in the form of purchases of, of crops, of raw materials, um, in, in that supply chain. And I think there's just one more click here. There might be two. Um, so when you add up the cumulative revenue of these smaller businesses, it becomes quite substantial, 700 million plus for businesses that are you know, all receiving loans under 250,000 um, relative to the smaller number of larger businesses. Um, so um, I think that might be it. Maybe there's one more click. Oh yeah, this is the last one. So I, th I think this is an interesting one to end on. So all of these are, they're, they're interesting numbers. Um, they're, they're numbers that we track on a loan by loan basis. Um, we consider them output metrics. They're not really telling us what the depth of impact is in terms of changing livelihoods. Are farmers and workers better off and how much better off are they because they're linked into these supply chains than they might be otherwise? Um, or how does financing at the SME level trickle down to affect uh, farmer worker livelihoods? Uh, but one interesting metric here is that on average, the smaller businesses are purchasing much more per farmer than the larger ones. Um, I think a few things are going on here. Uh, but one is that these larger businesses end up building significant networks of, of farmers. The, the depth and quality of the services um, may or may not be directly tied to size. And so this just speaks to the need for other types of impact evaluations to, to go deeper, to look at um, not just the number of farmers associated with the business, but what are the services those farmers are receiving and um, how do they, they compare? Um, and that's something that these numbers alone can't answer, but just wanted to, to share. Thanks, Brian. Again, a lot. And I'm familiar with Aseli, been following you and working with you for my whole three years at USAID. And I know I will need to review those numbers again and watch the recording myself. But I just want to emphasize for everyone, this is all, this is the type of data that a CELI collects. And uh, there's a saying I heard recently, you know, use it or create it. And we're talking about evidence. And, you know, really, I think what's so valuable about what a CELI does is this data they're collecting and the anal analyzing it and then sharing it uh, with others. So make sure you keep a lookout for their year three learning report, which will be out um, early next year that will revisit all this data and, and go into it in, in, in a much um, deeper level. So one thing that came up, um, Brian, you said is additionality. One thing I've always appreciated is the simplicity of your definition of additionality, first time borrowers. And I just saw a comment from John Shishitano, is that, is, is that a standard measure? Uh, I think, you know, I have an answer for that, but I wanna use that as a lead in, um, a lead in for you, Chris. So how do you think about the additionality of your investments that AgDevCo makes? Kevin Murutai from EcoBlocks and Tiles had made a comment on LinkedIn. 
I just wonder though, aren't the really big investees capable of raising funds from all sorts of investors? Yeah, it's a good challenge. Um, I mean, a number of ways to answer this. First, I'd say that size doesn't necessarily map onto profitability or attractiveness to commercial capital. So we we work with a number of companies that are now at a relatively large size and have relatively high financing needs, but um, they are not yet fully profitable or only marginally profitable, or it's considered that what they do is still quite risky. Um, so for them, accessing commercial capital is still very difficult. One example is a leasing business in Tanzania called uh, Equity for Tanzania. Uh, it does have some access to local bank funding now, uh, but that's only because uh, it now has two years of profitability. This was a company that was founded 15 years ago, and it's not going to be able to migrate to fully commercial capital, I would say, for a, another three to five years. So there's still a lot of additionality working with what may appear to be quite large companies. Um, how, how do we measure it? I mean, it's a key criteria for us that our investment committee will look at when we bring opportunities. And the test for us is, can the project that we're being asked to, be, to finance be funded by commercial capital? Um, and uh, the answer is almost always no when it's a long-term requirement involving significant equity risk. Um, but we have to tread a sort of fine line here. This was once described to me by someone from the IFC, actually, as being a, a, a bit like, um, uh, you know, your, your porridge being neither too hot nor too cold. If we were to back businesses that were so far from being attractive to commercial capital, then we would be at risk of backing failure. And actually, the demonstration effect would be that that you know, agribusinesses are losing money. Equally, we have to be careful not, not to back companies that are so large and profitable and hot that they, they already have access to private capital. We've got to tread a line in the middle where we're demonstrating over time those businesses can migrate from investment from the likes of AgDevCo to, to the private capital markets. And I'll speak to one example, the, the macadamia in, um, uh, in Malawi again. We were... Um, not the very first external capital, but we were the first capital of more than a million dollars to come into that business where we financed irrigation for the farm, which transformed the prospects uh, 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 of that business. Um, three or four years later, um, the company was then able to attract DFI capital from British international investment. And two years beyond that, it's been able to bring in local pension fund money from old mutual into an agribusiness in Malawi. Now we're still invested in that company. It still has more growth needs and it still um, can't fund 100% of its needs with commercial uh, debt and equity. It's got a mix in there, um, but we still see that being uh, highly additional. Eventually we would hope to be able to step back fully from these companies, but um, people talk about the missing middle. It's a concept we've used a lot in the past in my view, that missing middle extends really quite far up the, the transaction sizes. You know, it's like a pyramid. I mean, clearly at the level that a cell is operating at, there's very limited um, commercial money, um, if any. As you get up to transaction sizes of single um, digit millions, there is, you can start to see some private money coming in but these companies don't have 100% access. It's only when you get up to the very largest businesses, the multinationals, the big trading companies, and we don't work with those types of investee that they can rely on 100% private capital. Um, so additionality is a, is a complex issue. Um, and you do also have to balance it against um, impact and financial return and, and various other measures. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I'm doing a time check. We have a little less than 10 minutes left. So I'm going to just ask three questions, uh, and then you can answer any, uh, well, two questions, answer either of them, or just uh, share anything that you haven't had a chance yet to share that you want to make sure uh, that we got to. So um, the first question is from Tom. 
add one from Palladium, um, also from the LinkedIn post. It's basically defined and measuring success. We've talked about this, but I would rephrase it as saying, how do we as donors def distinguish between something that is uh, a good activity versus just good marketing, right? If you look at all their marketing reports, everything seems like it's a, a great success, but we know there's variations out there. How, how, how can we tell? Uh, second, another question from LinkedIn from Richard Lackey from the World Food Bank said, a focus on building agriculture ecosystems is hard work, but more sustainable than focusing on a single company project or program. I mean, I think basically saying, you know, we're focusing on transactions. Are we, are we focusing too much on transactions and not on the, on the system? So any, any thoughts, either of those questions or anything else you'd like to add to make sure before we, we run out of time. I'll start with you, Brian. Sure. Yeah. And well, and just to pick up on John's question earlier around additionality. So, um, Aceli defines a new borrower as one that hasn't received a loan of $15,000 or more from any source in the last 3 years. And so it's not just new to that lender, but new in the market. And that's a definition that we created. Um, I think it's appropriate for what we're doing. I'm not sure if it would be appropriate. Oops, sorry. Hit me. I'm not sure it would be, that should be the, the market wide definition um, for new borrower, but I'd also want to point out that it's not that we think about additionality as binary. Uh, there's a lot of businesses that have had previous access to finance and Chris alluded to this that are maybe getting, you know, they've had working capital finance. Now they're getting long-term finance or they're getting it on different terms. Um, one of our lending partners in Uganda has significantly lowered their collateral requirements in response to the risk sharing that, that we offer. And that's going to allow many more businesses to qualify for finance in the first place or to get more finance for the collateral that they have available. So new borrowers is just one indicator, a proxy for additionality. Don't at all want to suggest that it's on its own enough of a, a definition of additionality. Songbei, to your question on what donors should be looking for, I think that um, there's been too much attention paid to the headlines of Capital Mobilized. Um, Capital Mobilized I think should be relegated to a fourth priority. Um, and I would say the top three priorities are the additionality of capital that is being mobilized, the impact of that additional capital. Um, and you can look at that on the livelihoods of farmers and workers. You can look at it on um, food that's being more um, efficiently produced and supplied into the local market in lieu of expensive imports. You can look at any number of, of metrics. I think what becomes challenging is that you can't necessarily use output metrics to assess that impact. You're gonna to need to have some type of evaluation and finding right-sized ways of, of evaluating is really challenging. Uh, but I think it's the combination of that capital additionality and the impact in the numerator relative to the, the cost. And that's that's your value for money equation. And um, there aren't necessarily gonna be standardized ways to do it everywhere. But if I were a donor, I would kind of look at everything through that lens. So just to clarify, the cost is the third. The third, capital mobilized is a, after, I mean, it's it's relevant, but it's, it's it's specifically the additionality of capital mobilized, not capital mobilized in and of itself. And so, as Peter Bees from STC said on another webinar, it's an interesting number just for politicians. Um, Chris, your last word. Yeah. Um, well, on the impact question, so um, what what does success look like? Um, so I'd say there are two parts to this. Firstly, there's the direct impact that, that um, our investees create, uh, and that is relatively straightforward to measure. I mean, we insist that our, our investees provide us with the data on how many jobs they uh, create and sustain, on how many farmers they buy product from, on how many livelihoods they, they, um, they bring about. And so we can translate all of that into, um, additional income 
that goes into rural households. Uh, and we will report that to our funders and we were, we were held accountable um, for, for that reporting. Um, so we estimate today that our portfolio generates about $100 million of such income into to rural areas each year. Um, the, the second part is the transformational change I touched on earlier. Uh, are we seeing profitable, viable industries develop? Are we seeing replication by other investors? Um, that's much harder to predict, and it will take a lot longer before we can claim success. We won't really know for 10 or 20 years, and with hindsight, whether we've been successful there. Um, but um, we're beginning to be able to sort of tell the story. So one of our very early, very small investments in central Mozambique was in a, a small avocado um, farm of only around 40 hectares. That business did not give us a positive financial return, but it did demonstrate to a large South African player, Westphalia, that it was a good part of the world to grow avocados. And as a direct result of that investment, they then Westphalia came into Mozambique and set up a much larger commercial uh, plantation uh, where we also invested alongside um, the IFC. Um, so that's what really excites me over the long term, the transformational change potential, but it's hard to predict and hard to measure. Um, and then just quickly, I, I fully agree on the, the comment on the, the need for an ecosystem. I mean, it comes back to what I said right at the beginning. There's a need for multiple interventions at all levels to get more investment into agriculture, large and small, um, uh, bank lending and equity-like lending. Uh, and now that AgDevCo has just achieved profitability, we are looking to get back into the smaller early stage uh, investments, but with a separate ring fenced fund that will have a significant tranche of first lost capital. We'll aim to do better than losing 30% of that capital. We will aim to at least recover the capital we invest this time around. And we think we will be smarter in terms of selecting companies to work with, smarter in terms of the type of instruments we use, and smarter in managing the transaction costs. Um, because as Brian says, we do need to support the smaller earlier stage companies if we want to create the pipeline of the likes of the Hatch Africa or, or the Macadamia and the Avocado businesses. So um, it's just very tough. That's Thank you, mean. Chris. Thank you, Brian. I'm going to take the last 30 seconds and um, just close it out. Um, uh, so I want to say, just emphasize the last point that Brian made about moving beyond the discussions about the amount of leverage. Also, a point that Chris made, it's agriculture's hard. The fund is not looking for private capital. That's another thing I think we need to move off a little bit. You know, attracting new capital additionality may not be private capital. Second, things that sound the same are very different. Um, Unlocking private capital for African agriculture, one headline. Investing in sustainable agribusinesses to achieve positive social and environmental impact, another headline. That's actually the title of the annual report for AgDevCo and the learning report for Aselli. You can't tell the difference between what these two organizations do, whereas one focuses on deals from $15,000 to $1.75 million, and the other one from $3 million initial investments to total exposure up to 20 million. So we really need to peel back the onion a few layers to really see the type of impact that they're looking for. And lastly, the last point that Chris just made, we need a diverse ecosystem. We're not trying to say if one is better or the worse here. We're trying to say we need both, but understanding the role they, the role they play in the market. So thanks again to our speakers and uh, for all the attendees who joined, a recording will be made available Sorry, we couldn't get to all the questions in the chat, but we'll see if we can send them with the recording. Have a great holiday. Great. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Bye. Brian, Chris.